Ahora. Ahora sí. So, welcome everybody to the last session of this workshop and the last talk of this workshop. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Cecilia Salgado, who will give this, uh, this last talk of this afternoon. And she will talk on rank jumps on families of elliptic curves and Hilbert property. So please, Cecilia. Thank you very much, Paola. It's great to be here. I really have to say that I'm very happy to speak at this uh, yeah, I mean, moment. It's a very uh, important moment, I think, for the whole mathematics in life. I think the whole South, uh, sorry, there's someone entering and I just bumped it into my screen now. And it's a very, uh, I mean, important moment, I think, for us all mathematicians here. It's not only for you, but I have to say that it is just for me also, but for the whole mathematicians here. And uh, I'm very happy to take part into that because um, it means a lot for us here, for my students, for me, for the groups here in uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil as a whole. So thank you for putting a lot of work into that. I mean, yeah, to you all, Ruby, Angel, Sebastian, yourself, Paola, and to those that I didn't mention, but I know that have worked very hard for that. It's a big deal and I'm very thankful that you're yeah, working into that. Um, as the last speaker, I have the pleasure to thank you once more. And I would like to invite uh, all of you to put your microphones off or sorry, on and to clap hands for all of yeah, the people in the workshop involved. It's been a great three days. Um, it's been really very nice to follow all these talks in so many different fields related somehow. And um, I've learned a very good deal of nice and new mathematics. So thank you for that. It's been a lot of fun. And um, so I think now we can start with the mathematics and um, I will put into reproduction mode and I will not see you uh, anymore. So, and I will also not be able to follow the chat. So I would like to say, I'm sorry for that. Um, and what I'm gonna be speaking about, as you said, is about rank jumping in families of uh, elliptic curves and the relation of that to the Hilbert property. So I'm going to tell you what is the plan for now. So, oops, sorry. It's, oh, okay. So the new things that I'm going to tell you, they're joined to work with Dan Locker from uh, Bath in the UK. And uh, the plan is going to be as follows. So. First of all, I'm going to give you the basics of um, what we care for. I'm going to tell you two definitions or so, give you a few things to feel um, what we are doing. Then I'm going to tell you the problem um, that we care for and what we know about it. Um, finally, I will go over the method um, and give you a sketch of how we showed what we showed so and if time lets me do it i will tell you about what is next so what else can we do about this problem okay so let's start with the first definition which is the main one for this talk and that's of an elliptic surface so an elliptic surface for me is quite standard okay it's a smooth projective surface which comes with a morphism to some cu curve b so B is a smooth projective curve, which for this talk, you can suppose that it's P1, okay? For most of the things that I'm gonna do, it is P1. And we have a few, a few more things that we need um, from it. Namely, we want that the fibers are curves of genus one for all but finitely many T's inside B. And I want something, maybe this is the not canonical thing, that the vibration has a section. And I'm going to suppose for simplicity that it's relatively minimal. And relatively minimal means that it's uh, the surface doesn't have to be minimal as like really the surface. So you can have minus one curves inside of it that you can blow down to some other model, but not preserving pi. So there is no minus one curves components of my fibers of pi. That's what it means. Okay. 
well, a picture is worth more than, well, many words, 1,000 words, they say. So here's a picture of my surface. So in black, I have my surface. I have a smooth curve above a point in B in red. Then I have a singular fiber uh, lying above another red point, as you see. And in blue, I have the generic point of the basis of B. And above it, we have the generic fiber above the blue point, which is an elliptic. Uh, so it's an elliptic, uh, yeah, so sorry, it's a genus one curve for now over the function field of B, over KB. I'm going to tell you what K is very soon, what kind of field we're going to be working on. But for now, just any K field would work. And um, Moreover, I said I have a section, so let me draw this for you. A section is going to be drawn in green now. And the nice thing about the surfaces is that, so the sections meet the fibers in one point, right? Because, well, a section is a map that when I compose back with pi, I get the identity map. So it's meeting each fiber in one point, and uh, it does give me a KB point in the generic fiber as soon as I have a section defined over key, uh, K. Okay, so that's a section. And uh, moreover, I'm gonna also draw for you another curve in my surface, which is gonna play some hole for us soon. And that's what we call a multi-section. So a multi-section is some curve inside of my surface S, such that when I compose the map, so I mean, when I look at the map pi restricted to this curve here that you see, it's a flat map. So a multi-section, is something that becomes a section when I change basis for it, right? So this is in orange, okay? And the nice thing about these surfaces is that they give you uh, this twofold way to work with it, right? You can work with it as a surface as you usually would do, but also as an elliptic curve over the function field of B. So this is a very, uh, let's say, I mean, a powerful tool to deal with surfaces and such surfaces, they do happen um, very, uh, I, I mean, I would say throughout the whole classification of surfaces in all Kodaira dimensions, but one. So they don't happen in the last strata. So for the ones of general type, you do not see this happening, but for a Kodaira dimension minus infinity zero and one, you have these manifestations of surfaces there. And Kodaira dimension one, you do have this for uh, all surfaces, some kind of structure. I'm not claiming that I have a section though. Um, so why should you care about uh, these surfaces? So the thing is that they uh, do happen in many, many places, not only the ones that I care for, but maybe the ones that you care for. And so some reasons to care for them are as follows. So. The first one, say that you like maybe to study curves inside of surfaces, geometry, and you have this granted by the Shoda Tate formula that the model veil group, so which is the group of sections of my uh, vibration pi, this uh, you have a um, map which is one to one to the quotient, to the Neron Severi model of some lattice T, which is the trivial lattice which has inside of it uh, essentially the information of um, the components of the fibers and uh, the zero section. So thanks to that, you get a grip of more things about the uh, surface S that you're dealing with once you have such a structure in it. Say that you don't care about geometry, but you care about number theory. So if you care about number theory, um, one reason to like these surfaces is that, for uh, instance, uh, you can use them to prove results such as the risky density, potential density of your K points inside of the surface. Say that K is a number field and you want to prove that the K points of, your, yeah, uh, of the surface are the risky dense or a potential dense, meaning that they are dense over some finite uh, extension of K. Then you can use this uh, I mean, um, structure to show that. And that was done by Bogomolov and by Chinko in the uh, around 2000s. 
for K3 surfaces, they showed potential density for surfaces that do have such a structure. And I used them together with Van Lauk from Leiden to prove the risky density of the K points in the opposite surfaces of degree one. So that's a reason to care for the surfaces if you like number theory, but one more if you're interested into this kind of thing, since uh, more recently they have been used by uh, Collar and by Mela to prove K unirationality of conic bundles of degree one. So this was something that was for a long time uh, there and um, they finally uh, gave, uh, I mean, they finally showed this around 2014, 15 by using uh, an elliptic vibration inside of such surfaces, okay? Um, why else should you care about that? So I have more reasons for you. And that is a little different flavor, namely that I can use them to produce dense sphere packings. And this was done uh, independently by Shioda and by Noan Elkis. Um, and we still have standing records for some numbers, which I don't have them on top of my head now, but uh, the model veil lattices, so the model veil has a lattice, uh, I mean, a structure, which is a little more complicated than the neuron severi lattice, but uh, it's somehow given uh, by it, model some things. And the model veil lattice is giving you the densest sphere packings into some dimensions uh, up to now. Okay, I think at least three. And very recently, um, what well, recently, I mean, last year, I was using this kind of structures together with my collaborators to prove, uh, I mean, to give good correcting codes, uh, locally recoverable error correcting codes. And last but not least, a very important result, and which is, is still standing for the last 10 years or more, is the record for the rank of uh, an elliptic curve over Q. And this is 20, 28 by now. And uh, this was done using a K3 surface and looking at one elliptic vibration inside of it. Okay, so, and this is there since I would guess 2019, if I'm not mistaken. So this is some reasons to care. I can let you know that there are actually many, many more, but for simplicity, let's stop here and have a look at what these surfaces look like. So I prepared for you one example, which I consider to be the simplest one if you're not looking at trivial surfaces, which is like a product of a, an elliptic curve by some curve B. So I'm not gonna be looking into them today. And, uh, but I do have one example, which is very simple as well. And that is of a rational surface with an elliptic vibration. So that's the classic one. So you take F and G to cubics in the plane. And uh, let's suppose for simplicity that uh, at least F is a smooth cubic. Sometimes you don't have to do that, but to be sure that uh, I'm gonna get to something nice, I suppose one of them is smooth. So F and G, we know that being two curves of degree three, Bezu tells us that they meet in nine points counted with multiplicities. So we have this rational map here down on my slide, which is from P2 to P1, which takes a point to F at that point and G at that point. And it's clear that this map is not defined exactly where F and G meet because we are gonna have zero, zero. So uh, what do we do to get something which is defined uh, everywhere? So to get a morphism, we blow up the um, intersection locus of F and G, and then we get a surface, which is clearly because it's a blow up birational to the plane, but this one has a morphism to P1 and whose fibers, well, they are just combinations of F and G essentially, right, after the blow up. So they are of the form TF plus UG with T and U in P1. And uh, we also have sections. Who is my section? Well, at least uh, the last curve of my blow up is giving a section. It's meeting all the fibers in one point. So that's a copy of my P1 inside my surface. So this gives me a very beautiful section. And if you do it nicely, you might even be able to get eight, uh, I mean, independent sections and give and get the generic setting, which would be that the model view group has rank eight for those surfaces, but some things can happen and this can have model view group of rank zero as well, depending on how this F and G meet. And the nice thing that I have to share with you is that 
at least over an algebraically closed field, all rational surfaces with an elliptic vibration with section look like that. So they are given as the blow up of this locus of uh, two cubics meeting, okay? So they are all like that. And maybe it's a good thing to keep in mind for the rest of the talk because these surfaces are gonna come back to you, okay? So now back to general elliptic surfaces. So we saw one example of what they look like. And now I want to tell you a little bit more generalities of elliptic surfaces now over number fields. So from now on, K is a number field and this is gonna be for all the talk now. And um, so if we recall, now go back to elliptic curves, which are our fibers. So our fibers, they are elliptic curves because the sections are meeting them in one point, which is defined over K. So they are genus one curves with this special point. So they are elliptic curves. And therefore the model veil theorem tells us that for the special fiber, so for each point inside of B, I have a finitely generated uh, commutative group and uh, which is so of this form here as all finitely generated commutative groups. So it has some free part, which has rank RT and has some finite part, which, has, which varies maybe with T, right? And um, we are gonna be looking more at this free part in this talk. And the nice thing that um, um, I have to tell you is that this holds not only for the special fibers, but also for the generic fiber. So the generic fiber, recall what I said to you a couple of slides back, this is an elliptic curve over the function field of B. Therefore, for it, I have a version of the model veil theorem, which normally goes by the name of lang niron and uh, the theorem then gives us that uh, the set of KB points, which is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the group of sections, recall, uh, this is also a finitely generated uh, commutative group. Uh, and I have a free part of rank R and a finite part, torsion part of it, okay? And now we come to the natural question when we see these two quantities in the same screen, which is how do RT and R uh, relate to each other? How do they compare? How can I relate to them? Is it one bigger than the other? Are they the same? What can we say about them? So I'm gonna repeat this question to the next slide so we can think a little bit more about it and I can tell you what do we know about it. So um, the first thing is that I was not the first one to think about it. And uh, so I can trace this question at least back to Niron, but uh, the result that I'm gonna state here um, is due to Silverman in that form, but Niron had a result for higher dimensional, uh, yeah, I mean, fibers and bases of also. So he was looking at vibrations whose fibers were abelian varieties and the bases could be higher, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, dimensional. But uh, in the context um, of elliptic surfaces, Silverman's theorem tells us that RT is at least R for all but finitely many T in the basis. More precisely, actually, what it tells us is that uh, outside a set of bounded height, uh, we have this. But uh, just to tell you what Neuron did, uh, which, um, well, gets to Silverman T, yeah, like, result um, after some work, but uh, what he did for higher dimensional bases was to show that this would hold um, outside a thin set. And thin is in red to remind me that I have to tell you what this is. And uh, I will tell you that soon. So keep that for a second, the question of what is a thin set and let me tell you uh, in a couple of slides from now because this will be quite important for today. So once you get this result, the result is saying a lot and it's quite important result, the, I mean, a specialization result, but more questions come up, right? We prove something nice and more things come that have to be done. And so the natural question, uh, once we look at a bound like that, which is, well, can we say more? Can we say that this is a strict, I mean, inequality for a large set? What kind of large set? Can I 
make the rank ju jump. So I'm going to say that the rank jumps uh, once this inequality is a strict uh, one. And we want to know how much can it jump, yeah, like really jump and still in a large set, in an infinite set or something like that. So that's the topic of the next slide. And it's better bounds. Can I give better bounds for this rank RT? And uh, well, indeed we can. And again, I was not the first one thinking about it. I'm coming late, but I'm happy because I get all this very nice work done before. And a French mathematician, Billard, uh, Hervé Billard, did it around 2000. This was his PhD work, was one part of it. He gave under some hypothesis, which I list here for you, namely that the surface is rational over Q. So um, this means that uh, it has a birational map to P2, okay, which is defined over Q. So it's very different from what I said before. So it doesn't have to be the blow up of the nine points in two cubics over Q, but it does have some birational map uh, to P2. Maybe the minimum model is a del peso of degree five, okay? So maybe it's something like that stops before, but has some birational map to P2 meaning then that P2 is a minimum order over Q to it, but maybe I can stop before by contracting sections. And uh, in that case, also, if the surfaces has a known isotrivial vibration. So this means, um, well, two ways of saying it. Firstly, the J invariant is not a constant, so it's not in the field K. Second way of saying it, um, the surface doesn't become trivial. So after some base change, after some finite base change, it doesn't become the product of some curve uh, E by the curve B prime. So it doesn't become trivial after base change. Then uh, this set that I define here as the set for which the rank jumps, okay? So it's at least R plus one is an infinite set. And his methods were, uh, he used heights, okay? So therefore, um, his work is very much restricted to Q because he builds up on previous work, which is only known uh, over Q. So it's a lot of height machinery. And uh, I later, um, this is also part of my PhD thesis, um, later I showed that, uh, well, I can relax this hypothesis. So instead of rational, let's look at unirationals. Yeah, like surfaces, but and instead of Q, the rational numbers, we can allow any number field K. And I think that this actually would be also true for many other kinds of fields, maybe perfect fields um, in general. But uh, then uh, this set is an infinite set. And the techniques here are very different from VR. I confess I tried heights, but I didn't manage. And then the techniques here are geometrically, purely. And therefore, I could let my k be a number field, and which is the case that we care for. Of course, we don't want to do base changes over k bar. Um, and uh, I will tell you more about the methods uh, very much soon, OK? And uh, But I got some better bounds also. So under a little more I mean, restrictive hypothesis, which is that the surface has at least two conic bundle structures over K, then I showed that the rank jumps of at least two in an infinite set as well. So now we have a lot of uh, relations between the generic rank R and the special ranks RT. And well, again, I said, we, we do something, what's next, right? So what's the next natural question? And the next natural question is, what about the quality of those sets? Remember that in the previous slide, it was very much qualitative in the sense that uh, what Silverman does is for all but finally. So far from a set of bounded height, what Niron did before in the 50s was, well, it's happening far from a same set. set. So this was all qualitative, while what we have here is just, it's an infinite set and we don't know nothing about um, how this set is uh, in the line P1. So is it, sometimes I do find something, where are they with kind of, um, is it dense in some sense? 
And uh, after all, they did give qualitative, uh, yeah, well, I mean, results. So we get to the point uh, where I want to deal with this. So the goal of this talk is to tackle the quality of these ads. And uh, so what do we hope for? So there is what we hope for, of course, and what we can do. So what we hope for, this is in the 80s, Silverman conjectured that RT would be R or R plus one, 100% of the time when I uh, order the, the fibers by height. So I take the limit, right? Uh, of my height bound going to infinity, and I look at the set of um, the file of fr plus one or fr or, or fr whatever, or and then I quotient this by all the curves into, I mean, in this box, right? And he conjectured that this would be either r or r plus one, a hundred percent of the time. Of course, that a hundred percent of the time does not, uh, I mean. Um, take out the fact that it can jump much more than that, can jump two, three, or maybe more eventually um, in an infinite set. After all, uh, I mean, um, it can happen that, uh, I mean, an infinite set is giving me 0% uh, of my yeah, fibers. So let's look at the quality line here in a, a, I mean, down. And the density would be what we expect what we knew uh, in 2011 after my results and before in 2000 is that it's an infinite set under some hypothesis. We are far from a uh, general like setting for any uh, surface which has this structure, but I do have results for K3 surfaces though, which I didn't mention here. And uh, today what I want to do is let's sustain the middle. And the middle here is, uh, well, as they say, take it with a grain of salt and sugar on top, because, um, yeah, I maybe should be more modest and put it more to the left. And uh, today's goal then is to show that this set where the rank jumps of at least one, maybe two, is a set which is not thin. So, you know what, it's not so bad after all. So let me tell you what's a thin set, finally. So it was in red again that I would not forget to tell you, but it's on my slides anyways. And uh, so a thin set, um, so the definition of thin sets uh, could be uh, motivated, I could say, by Hilbert's irreducibility theorem. And, uh, but um, the definition that I'm gonna give to you and that I use goes back to Serre. And uh, I learned this in his book, Lectures on Model Veil Theorem, which covers much more than the, uh, yeah, like, I mean, a model veil. It's a great book. So um, uh, it's in two steps, this definition. So I'm going to consider a variety V, an algebraic variety V over K. So think of a nice variety, smooth, um, everything you like projective uh, for this talk. It's really enough. and. Um, a subset of the k points of my variety. So k here again is any field for this slide. And uh, a subset is said to be of type one if it's contained in a proper Zariski closed set. So it's not Zariski dense. <laughs> and it's said to be of type two if it's contained in the image of the k points of a dominant morphism of degree at least two. So w here can be uh, taken to have the same dimension as v. And uh, what I'm saying, so this is stronger, right? This is um, giving you a lot more. Uh, you could have that uh, your points are not of type one, but that they are of type two. So you have sets which are, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. So they are not contained in the uh, in an image of some dominant morphism of degree uh, two or more. And uh, a set will be called thin if it's contained in a finite union of subsets of those two types, okay? And uh, I said the word, I said the name Hubert before, and uh, the thing is that a variety set to satisfy the Hubert property over a field K, any field K, if the set of K points of this variety is not a thin set. And uh, you can also look in the uh, other uh, way, you can reverse the way you deal with these things and deal with the field. And look, uh, so a field is going to be called Hilbertian if there is a variety that satisfies the Hilbert property over this field. So clearly, um, 
you could take this variety if a field is version, P1 is going to be the variety that you're going to be looking at, okay? Or Pn for any n, if P1 satisfies, Pn satisfies. So maybe this is new to you, maybe it's not, but in case this is new, let me give you a few examples. So uh, number fields are Hilbertian fields. So Pn satisfies the Hilbert property. Local fields are not Hilbertian. So R is not Hilbertian, P addicts are not Hilbertian. Um, the set of squares in a number field is a good, uh, I, mean, uh, uh, I mean, is a same set. So it's clear because uh, it's in the, I mean, uh, here you can take the map from A1 to A1 or P1 to P1, T to T square, and the set of squares lie there. The set of any powers that you might like is a same set. So, I mean, an infinite set no, from what we saw and from these examples can be a thin set. And people have worked out uh, what kind of uh, quota, um, what kind of bounds you would have to make sure that the set is not thin. So you would have to have some points up to some bounded height in the set, okay? And, uh, but this is not the goal of our talk because I'm not doing height theory here. So now I get to the half of the talk almost, and I can tell you um, what did we do? So what's our contribution? So from now on, this is joint work with Dan Lochran. Uh, before it was just generalities. And our contribution then is, um, as I said, we are gonna show that the rank jumps in a set, which is not thin. And so we have some hypotheses and the hypotheses are actually nicer than the ones you saw on the better bound slides in the sense that we go further. I mean, we don't have to restrict ourselves more, but uh, on the contrary, we can push a little further the class of surfaces for which the rank jumps and moreover jumps on a set which is not thin. Uh, so the first one says that if I have a geometrically rational surface, so it's a rational elliptic surface, so over K bar, this surface uh, is defined uh, as a blow up of P2 in the nine base points of a pencil of cubics. But uh, here, again, I'm dealing with number fields K. So K is from now on always a number field. So I forgot the K in the first theorem. But S is a geometrically rational elliptic surface, which is defined over K as a rational elliptic surface, meaning, <coughs> sorry, that the section is defined over K. <coughs> and I suppose, moreover, sorry, that uh, the vibration has a bisection of genus zero. And then what we show is that the set for which the rank jumps is not thin. The second result says that if we have the same hypothesis, but moreover, um, the vibration has at most one non reduced fiber or has a two torsion section defined over K then I can get rank jump two in a set which is not thin. So this is, I mean, I still feel, even though it doesn't contradict at all, I still feel it quite surprising in the light of the, I mean, a conjecture from Joe Silverman from the uh, I mean, uh, 80s, in the sense that, okay, I'm not expecting this set to have some density property, right, to be dense, but uh, in, with respect to some height, but still it's a set which is quite, large, uh, it's, it's not a thin set. So before I go on, I have two things to do uh, before I tell you a little bit about the proofs and the methods that go on. First thing, I wanted to discuss the hypothesis of the theorem a little bit. And uh, well, the hypothesis of uh, bisection here. So first the hypothesis of being rational as a surface uh, this does come back to my work from 2011 in the sense that I did use base change, but uh, in order to be sure that the rank would jump, I will say a little bit more on that again, I needed to have a family of rational curves in my surface. And surfaces that have families of rational curves, um, I mean, there's not much where we can look, right? So better be rational or something on that sense. So it's geometrically rational because I am using 
And then uh, I am using that I have plenty of rational curves in my surface. So that's the hypothesis of rational. And the bisection here, I could have stated it differently because what we actually do is using that it's rational. So in particular, it's a regular surface. So the, I mean, uh, H1 of the structure shift is uh, zero. So we can use him and Ho and I mean, deform this bisection to get a conic bundle inside of my surface. So the hypothesis could be, suppose you have a geometrically rational elliptic surface with a conic bundle structure. Well, it's, I mean, we did notice that it suffices to have one bisection to get for free the whole conic. So to impress you, I put you only one curve, but what is hidden here that we get for free this uh, conic bundle structure. Therefore, I'm supposing a bisection of genus zero. Okay, and on the second theorem, which is a little more strange, right? This geometric hypothesis first, a non-reduced fiber. Well, let me tell you that uh, rational elliptic surfaces, uh, the type of fibers on them, they have been classified by Persson uh, a while ago, 90s or yeah, I guess, or 80s or 90s. Or, and uh, there are around 300 types. When you go to K3, it's much more. And these 300 types, there is only one type that has more than one non-reduced fiber, which is actually two non-reduced fibers, which are, for those who care for these things, I0 stars. There are two I0 stars. So you have this one uh, I mean, a class of surface. I cannot say it's one surface because even though they have more than value rank zero, they have, uh, I mean, they vary in a family. So they have moduli different from all the other, I um, mean, uh, in a extremal rational elliptic surfaces. All the extremal rational elliptic surfaces, meaning those that have rank zero, have no moduli, but for this nasty one that has two non reduced fibers. And then, um, so this is a very big class in theorem two. And then you put the hypothesis of a two torsion section, which is concerning precisely the case of two non reduced fibers. So, surfaces with two non reduced fibers have a full two torsion gr group. And what we need is that uh, part of this two torsion group is defined over K. Okay, so that's the hypothesis here. And again, why do we do that? When we get a two torsion section defined over K, this is not the section itself. But the section is letting us glue and find a second conic bundle in the surface. So this surface will have two distinct conic bundles, which is a tool needed to deal with two non-reduced fibers. Because when we do two base changes with two non-reduced fibers, we cannot use the same, uh, I mean, yeah, the same, uh, let's say, I mean, um, sorry, uh, bundle to do that. So now before I go on, I like to see one more uh, example. And let me tell you maybe a little bit about the story, the kind of I mean, history behind this result. So as I said, I had my result in 2011. Then I generalized it with Mac uh, Mina. So this was Mac Hindri and I, we generalized this for abelian varieties. So for vibrations on abelian varieties uh, a couple of years ago. And then Max spoke about this result in a workshop. And then Lockram was there, as me also, I was there. And he asked, uh, is this set? What is this set? Is it thin for which the rank goes up? Uh, what kind of set this is? People were starting to look at, the, at this kind of sets at this moment for those varieties with conic bundles and unirrationality and so on. And we couldn't say whether it was thin or not. We had no clue at that moment. And then uh, I met Dan Lockram a couple of months later at the Max Planck in Bonn. And then we started working on this when we met because it sounded like fun. And that's what we did for these two results here. But uh, why did I say at this moment when Dan came and, and said to Mark, is this that thing on his talk? And we both couldn't uh, give an answer. The thing is that there was no one thing in the literature which would point to one uh, of the two directions, whether it would be thin or not. There was not one example for that. 
So we couldn't, at least not that we knew. So we started to think, well, is it really, maybe it's not thin. And uh, so let's look at one example that is quite celebrated. So this is due to David Hollick. And uh, you can consider an elliptic curve over your number field. So it's really a curve over number field with model of A or rank one. Then um, you can construct an elliptic surface by considering the family of quadratic two, uh, sorry, quadratic twists. And so I twist by T this, and I have uh, ST my fiber. So this is an elliptic surface fibered over the T line. It's an isotrivial surface, has two non-reduced fibers. Sorry for that. And uh, as an, I mean, as an elliptic surface, this has rank zero, generic. But uh, every time I take T a square, I get back E. So my rank is one. So the rank is jumping and was known to jump in various contexts by mathematicians. But all, I mean, when we would put the finger into that context and try to get a little bit, either we couldn't get nothing of it or we would see that it's a thin set. So therefore, we, when we started, we didn't know what to, uh, I, mean, um, I mean, what would come of it. So now, finally, in the last uh, 18 minutes of the talk, I can give you a little bit about uh, what goes into the proof. So this is really rough, but I can give you a few ingredients, OK? So the key thing, as I said, goes back, uh, well, to before me, but uh, as the way we use it was the way that I used it in 2011. And this is we start with our surface S. This is, has an elliptic vibration, which we called pi. I consider some curve C that lives inside of S and I base change by it. So lives inside of S and it's not a fiber component, okay? It's not vertical it's with respect to pi. And I consider then the restriction of my vibration to, to C. And this gives me the map phi here, the map phi. And I base change then by uh, phi. Um, so uh, what I get is this surface SC, which um, is smooth if the base change is branched only on smooth fibers. Otherwise, it's singular. If you have a singular fiber on the ramification law, because it's a singular surface, but you blow up, and then you get a nice uh, elliptic surface uh, that satisfies the definitions that we have. So this is. Moreover, every section of the vibration pi is mapping to a section via pull back to the vibration pi c. So pi c has at least the same generic rank as pi, OK? My, but I have a new section, a new section, which is given by the inclusion of c inside of uh, sc. So this new section was not present in pi. This is great because uh, remember, we are trying to make the rank jump. How are we going to do this? We are going to find a new section. And uh, so for now, we only know that it might jump. We have an inequality, but which is not necessarily strict. And But if this new section is not dependent on the sections that I had in S, then I can say that uh, mapping back via phi, I get curves for which the rank jump. And now you have all the right to ask me, well, um, so what? Why is this uh, nice? How do you get an infinite set for which the rank would jump? Well, choose C well enough. And therefore, there was the meaning of I need rational or maybe K3 to produce a curve C that has an infinite number of rational points. So C has to be either an elliptic curve with positive rank or a rational curve right with the k point on it. So that's what we need. So once we would find this c and make sure that c satisfies the last dot that you see here, namely that c is not dependent on the sections of pi, we are game. We have one and we jumped the rank if the curve c has infinitely many rational points. So that's our task for the last 10 minutes. Let's make sure that the rank jumps. So to make sure that the rank jumps, I need surfaces which have, for this talk, many rational curves. Um, I will say a little bit more about K3s in, at the very end of the talk. Um, and the key lemma that I proved in my thesis um, um, a little before, so that's when the paper came out, 
shows that uh, if I have, if my curve C is actually uh, deforming, so if it lies in a linear system of positive dimension, and of course, I'm not taking fibers, I'm not taking something which is not helping me to do base change, then uh, all but finitely many curves in the linear system would be good. So would give sections that make the rank jump after base change. So what we have to do is give hypotheses to make sure that the surface S contains such a linear system. And then we would get that the rank jumps inside of uh, an infinite set. And that's the hypothesis of K, I mean, a unirational from my work in 2011. This would be a good candidate. But um, for us, the hypothesis is that the surface is geometrically rational. So this is more than being K unirational, but uh, having a bisection on it actually will make it have a conic bundle. And by the work of Collar, Mela, and many others that dealt with conic bundles before, it turns out that our surfaces are unirational over K. Good news. So let's use the hypothesis. Um, again, the theorem said that I have a bisection of gen zero, and I explained to you that this gives me the conic bundle. So I, I can actually, I know that I can make the rank jump in an infinite set. Okay, and this comes from the bisection, from the fact that I have the conic bundle structure. And as I said, the argument I write down here into lines, but I had already explained to you. And uh, the vibration, one thing I didn't say, but it's, um, well, uh, true for our surfaces, the elliptic vibration on geometrically rational surfaces, when I suppose that they are relatively minimal, there is only one and uh, it's given by the anti-canonical linear system. So this means that the canonical has square zero, has self-intersection zero, as the fibers of my, yeah, like pi have to have self-intersection zero. And then we can use this to show that the surface is a unirational surface. And at that point, we would use the curve, the curves in my system to increase the rank using the lemma that I mentioned to you. But now if you're paying a, very much attention to what I'm saying. You remember the definition of sensat, right? I hope you do. And I mean, if you don't, I'm going to tell you again. This set that I'm using, namely C, right? The new basis, the, the points in the new basis, it's a sensat. After all, the, the set for which is really jumping the rank, it's a set which lies in, in phi. So lies on phi of C inside B. So it's the perfect definition of a set of type two. So it's the same set. And it's even just one set. I don't have to take unions or nothing at this point. So you tell me, oh, okay, what are you gonna do now? So what's the strategy? So the strategy for us was actually to notice that uh, there is one thing I told you, I can use all C's on the pencil. So. I don't have to just look at one C in my linear system spanned by C. I can take another member of it and maybe make use of it. So the strategy for us to give a little bit information about the quality of this set is to consider all curves at once. And that's what we're gonna do. And uh, remember then, how would we show that a set in P1 is not thin? So what I have to do is to take, well, for P1, right? I don't have to pay attention to sets of type one. After all, they are just finite sets, right? Inside of the risky closed set. So those are points. But I have to pay attention to sets of type two. So to pay attention to sets of type two, what I do is that uh, I have to consider a finite number of covers of my basis B, any finite number of covers. And I have to find a curve in C. Once I fix this finite number of covers, I have to look inside C, the linear system, and find a curve that, when I restrict the vibration to it, has a point which maps to B, but doesn't lie in the union of the, I mean, um, of these covers, of the points that come from the covers. So that's what I have to do. I have to start fixing covers a finite number, I don't know what they are, but I fix a finite number and I produce 
a cut, yeah, sorry, a C that uh, does not, that has some point P that maps uh, to something that doesn't lie in the locus uh, spanned by the uh, you know, image of the covers. That's what we have to do. So um, that's the next slide and explaining this once more. Sorry, um, I have to show them that I, I will call my covers um, YI. So P1 is my basis B, as I told you, because my surface is rational, the basis has to be P1. So I'm taking N covers or N is some natural number. And I, what I have to do is to show that uh, for my set, T here would be representing the set FR plus one that I build by using the curve C in the linear system. And I have to be inside of P1K, but uh, far from the union of CI, sorry, phi I of uh, YIK. Okay, so now we are gonna avoid the covers, okay? So to avoid the covers, I somehow changed the map. I call this C now. So I have CI, the maps from YI to B, and I have to find a point P in C prime, where C prime lies in the pencil span by C. Okay, such that phi, phi is the same one from the first uh, slides when I was doing base changing. Phi uh, of P is not in the image, okay? And um, if I do that, right? So if my curve, when I consider the fiber product of YI and C prime is an integral curve, I can apply Hurwitz formula to it, right? And um, well, since all these maps there have degree at least two, okay? The genus, so I have a genus zero thing here, here why I can have any genus, so for simplicity or to make things harder for me, you can even suppose that it's of genus zero, but you don't have to, but uh, Hovitz, yeah, so I can use Hovitz formula for uh, the fiber product and I would get that the genus of it is at least one. Um, the problem, uh, so since the curve C prime, remember, is a curve which is in my, uh, I mean, a conic, yeah, I mean, uh, it's in the linear system C, so it's a P1. Um, it satisfies the Hubert property, which means that I have points inside of C that map to B and that do not map to the points that came from II, okay? So this is precisely what I need, right, uh, to avoid uh, the cover. So that's what I have. So since I do have a point which is in C prime, but it's not on the C i's, and this is on the C i, sorry, I mean a tilde on top. And therefore, this means that the y i's are not mapped to it. So what I do uh, in the end of the day is to use the Hubert property for the curve C on the second degree of the diagram, sorry, on the second stage of the, like, yeah, I mean, a diagram that I have here. But we still have a problem for the last uh, five minutes, which is how can I make sure that this is an integral, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, say that the fiber product is something which is good for us, which is not splitting many curves. Because if it, I mean, if it is splitting, then you cannot use Hovitz. You cannot do nothing to get conclusions for um, for the points inside C prime. So to show that a point of C prime does not map to some point that comes from YI. So that's what we would need now. And for that, what we need, we could just look at the function field diagram, uh, which is parallel to that one. And uh, what I need is that the function field, uh, they are linearly disjoint over the function field of B. This is more than what I need. Actually, it's a sufficient, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, for sure, but not necessary as you're gonna see soon. So to get that the function fields are linearly disjoint, I recall that I have a bisection given by all my curves in the linear system C. So the function field KC prime over KB is is a quadratic field, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, extension. And uh, now I have my KYI over K of B, which is some finite field, uh, I mean, uh, over KB. 
And uh, the point is that since they are finitely many, there is only finitely many quadratic uh, extensions lying in it. Thus, uh, if I would happen to show that uh, when I vary C prime in the linear system C, I get an infinite set of quadratic, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, like fields, I would be good. And uh, so that's what I need, right? Because then I just have to throw and not to look at the finitely many that lie inside of KYI over KB. And uh, this is actually true because as I have only one non-reduced fiber, we can show that the, I mean, a ramification of this map. So this map is a degree two map of P1s. So this is ramified in two points. And uh, one of them might happen to be over the non-reduced fiber. And when it's over the non-reduced fiber, a phenomena can do, I mean, can happen and does happen in practice, which is that all curves ramify there. But uh, since all my fibers left are reduced fibers, I cannot have an infinite number of curves in a, I mean, in a linear system meeting a reduced fiber in a non-reduced way in order to give ramification. So the ramification has to vary. And ramification varying means that function fields have to vary. So in the case that I have only one non-reduced fiber, I'm good. And I concluded the rank jump of one in the sense that I did get a point in the diagram of the previous slide far from the yi's because my cases are distinct and the fiber product is an integral curve. But uh, when I have two non-reduced fibers, this is precisely uh, the case that I showed you in the slide about uh, I mean, uh, the twist family, right? And uh, they can all have the same ramification. And as I said, it happens for the trivial bundle that we would find there, the um, nice bundle, conical. But uh, they do still have non-isomorphic fields. Uh, and um, so the configuration I told you in advance it was two I zero start. And uh, the Weierstrass uh, equation is of that form, okay, with um, f and g separable of, well, f of degree three and g of degree at, uh, at most two. Okay, I could put the G in the side of the Y square, doesn't matter, it's a quadratic twist family. And uh, I have a bisection which is given by this conic uh, here. And then I can vary X zero and this varies the bisection. So that is how I get the conic bundle vibration in it. And the problem is that uh, this map, they always ramify in the zeros of the polynomial G. So to show that it's linearly disjoint, what we do is we explore the surface a little bit more. And now we don't do geometry or we do geometry, but in an arithmetic way of doing it. So we have to, and this uh, slide here, so we have to build up on the work of Julio Telen um, and maybe many uh, others that um, this surface on the previous slide is what we call a shuttle surface. So let's have a look at these extensions. So they look like that. So KT is the function field of B. And then I put this square root. Okay, it's a quadratic uh, I mean, uh, extension. And this allows me to write the K points of my surface as some union uh, over all these fields that I have there. And the point is that if I just have finitely many of those, this means that I can write the K points in my surface as a finite union of proper closed sets inside of it, which are thin sets. We can show that they are thin. And uh, sorry, they are not proper closed sets. They are type two sets. And uh, this contradicts the fact that this is a shuttleless surface. And thanks to Coliotelen and uh, Sansuk, we know that it satisfies the Hubert property. So, it cannot have that the K points are of, of type two. So what I'm gonna do, um, because now it's precisely 3.30, I'm gonna stop here, but tell you, I had prepared the rank jump twice. And here are some, I mean, uh, work directions that we could uh, go to. So the first one, I have no idea of what to do, 
The second is how we started working, but I also, at the moment, I don't know how to tackle it. And the last two, my PhD student is dealing with them at the moment. So I finish here and I thank you once more. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for your talk. <laughs> So please, if uh, anyone has questions or comments, uh, please feel free to open your microphone and ask. Okay, so if there are no questions, please join me in thanking again uh, Cecilia. Oh, thank you all again, right? All the speakers and all of you, pa Paola, Angela, Ruby. Let's thank all of you once more also for this brilliant uh, three days. I'm really happy to take part on it. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so this is, I mean, if anyone else wants to, to say